Hi, I'm Deanna Jo, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. So I'm back a little early from my summer break. Um, it was because this whole series of events kind of came to an end and sort of prompted that. So, um, and this video has been in the works for about 10 months. And so what it is about is I was recently involved in the early stages of a United Pentecostal Church International, that would be the UPCI, um, judicial process. And I'm going to share my experience with it, as well as host survivors sharing their experiences. And I'm going to break it up into three parts for the sake of time and, you know, hopefully an interview. So <laughs> how did this all get started? Um, well, last fall, I was actually feeling pretty grieved over the extensive sexual abuse cases and the alleged cover-ups at the Calvary Gospel United Pentecostal Church in Madison, Wisconsin, under the pastorate of John Wesley Grant. And honestly, as a member of the body of Christ, seeing the destruction it caused, I felt responsible to figure out if there was anything I could do to bring just even a little justice to this situation. So I prayed about it. And I decided to just go straight to the top <laughs> and write a letter to David Bernard, the general superintendent of the UPC, to see if he would or could do anything about it. And it took a couple of grueling months for me to write and rewrite and perfect my letter and to just gather all the information for my reference notes, um, you know, just so they'd know I wasn't making faceless claims, that this was a very serious situation. And I included contact information for the Madison police officers and the district attorney involved in the Glenn Uselman case. Um, I, sh I gave them screenshots of incriminating social media posts made by some of the abusers. I linked to news articles about the victims of this church and even some screenshots of their own publications with relevant information. So, <laughs> you know, my grade 10 and 11 self who wanted to be a lawyer would have been proud. And it was kind of, you know, I enjoyed pulling everything together. It was an interesting process. So I sent my letter International Registered Mail to David Bernard, and today I would like to read that letter to you um, in part one, and I will share in the upcoming videos just sort of how that process went. Um, I do want to preface this by saying that John Grant and even Roy Grant and Stephen Dahl have never been charged with a crime, nor have they admitted any guilt and that my statements in this video and in this letter are based on allegations made by multiple survivors who attended Calvary Gospel Church over several years. So this is my letter. Dear Dr. Bernard and members of the general board, this submission is an official complaint against UPCI licensed minister, Reverend John Wesley Grant, Bishop and former pastor of Calvary Gospel Church in Madison, Wisconsin. A copy of this complaint was not sent to the current Wisconsin District Superintendent and District Board because of the scope of John Grant's influence within that district. His legacy and the likelihood of him being viewed as a mentor and friend to many of the district officials made it seem unwise. I hope you understand my reasoning. John Grant supported and promoted men in ministry he knew to be predatory. Not only did he not warn the congregation about these men and their sexual attraction to minors so they could keep a watchful eye on their children, he permitted them to hold positions of leadership in the church that would grant them trust and easy access to children and teens. There are public allegations of him covering up and failing to report several cases of sexual abuse as pastor of Calvary Gospel Church and the Wisconsin District Superintendent. 
Public accounts highlight his deceptive and harsh treatment of the minor victims of these crimes, leading some to believe he was reporting to the police, which he never did. The Madison Police Department has no record of him or other CGC leaders ever reporting abuse of any kind. Minor victims from John Grant's church recall being made to feel they had done something wrong when he became aware of the sexual abuse and impropriety they experienced from adult men at CGC. He is accused of coercing victims into public confessions and apologies to the church under the threat of being isolated from church-related activities. Some were forced to step down. Others report being socially isolated when their CGC peers were told to avoid them. This sent a strong message. Keep your mouth shut unless you want trouble. When John Grant found out about her abuse, sexual abuse survivor Lisa Coombe recalls him telling her she had to confess and apologize to the women in the congregation if she wanted to continue attending church the church school, and the youth group. Terrified and humiliated, she did what she was told. Despite confessing, she was still kicked out of the CGC school and the youth group and shunned by her church friends who were instructed to avoid her. John Grant told Lisa and her parents, Dan and Laura Anderson, that he was taking care of the problem and led them to believe that Madison police would be informed. It's only in recent years that they realized it was never reported. Another CGC minor abuse survivor, Rebecca Martin Bird, shared with Lois Gibson of spiritualabuse.org that she sent a letter to a childhood friend detailing some of her abuse. Her friend's older sister, Lucy, saw the letter and took it to John Grant. And this is a quote. When she approached Pastor John Wesley Grant with the original letter, it is alleged that Grant proclaimed she had written it to herself to get attention. He proceeded to call Lucy a liar and kicked her out of the choir for a year. She shared that singing was and is my life. When the year was over, she approached John Grant about rejoining the choir and he allegedly told her to leave his office as she had lied and tried to strike down God's anointed, meaning Uselman. Fear and shame were dominant memories many survivors took away from their time at CGC. The line between minor girls and adult men was blurred. The congregation and leaders accepted couples with dramatic age differences as normal. Nobody thought it odd or objected to them sitting together in church or going out to eat together afterward. The normalization of such behavior by trusted adults, including their pastor, John Grant, would undoubtedly impact how the young girls of that church perceived what was normal and appropriate. Adults set the tone. Leaders set the tone. More than one victim from that church turned 18 and married her abuser, well into his 30s, to make things right and avoid burning in hell. As you can imagine, marrying an abuser only furthers trauma and abuse. Too often, victims shoulder the shame and responsibility of trying to fix things. Predators are deceptive and sneaky, rarely feeling that same urgency. During the recent sexual abuse sentencing of Glenn Uselman, he stated that he was in no hurry to get married and wanted to wait, but that Rebecca pushed for them to get married as soon as she turned 18. It makes sense that she would. Research shows that women who experience grooming and sexual abuse as minors are often well into adulthood before clearly realizing the exploitative dynamic they experienced. It takes time for them to feel emotionally ready to process the trauma once they fully understand what was done to them and some eventually speak out. That's often when they're met with judgment from people wondering why they didn't speak out sooner. Debbie McNulty recalled watching her 11-year-old daughter play outside in a little red 101 Dalmatians tracksuit and the realization hitting her 
that this was the same age she was when her abuser took a sexual interest in her and began abusing her. It was eye-opening for her to realize just how young and innocent she'd been. Hardly the calculating seductress and loose child the church labeled her as. Eleven is not an age where an adult predator can reflect on the interaction, characterizing it as adultery. She was a child, incapable of consenting. When made aware, John Grant should have been horrified. Instead, to this day, he has besmirched her childhood reputation with vulgar accusations. Studies show that women who were minor sexual abuse victims are more likely to become victims of domestic abuse, suffer from chronic illness, PTSD, depression, and anxiety. They have increased risk of substance abuse, eating disorders, suicide, self-harm, and unsafe sexual behavior, which would sadly confirm to a harsh, watchful church that these girls were immoral to start with and the problem all along. It changes everything for them. These long-term impacts make initially handling these situations appropriately and compassionately as ministers and as the body of Christ so crucial. Survivors need support to recover and have healthy futures. Judgment and blame from their pastors and church family add secondary abuse to their trauma, which is why many flee the church. This has happened numerous times with multiple victims from Calvary Gospel Church. It seems John Grant consistently failed to conduct himself in a protective, ethical, and godly way on behalf of multiple minor sexual abuse victims within his church, yet he enjoys a legacy of respect and status within the UPC organization. This complaint is not simply addressing a regrettable mishandling of abuse he was unprepared for early on in his ministry. This was a pervasive attitude and pattern of behavior that started at the top with him and trickled down influencing the rest of the congregation, including victims' parents. It continued for decades, making CGC an unsafe environment for young women, and I believe that environment is still present in that church. I recently saw a J.T. Pugh quote, whatever is in the heart of the pastor will come out in the congregation. That's certainly been the case in Madison. This attitude was on public display at Glenn Uselman's criminal sentencing in October of 2022. Madison UPC members and CGC connected people packed his side of the courtroom, supporting a convicted child predator. I ask you to reconsider whether John Grant is deserving of his 2014 induction into the UPCI's Order of the Faith. In light of the public allegations against him, this feels like an added insult to victims he failed and humiliated over the years. It also casts a shadow over the respectability of the award itself, lessening the honor for other worthy recipients. I'd also point out the irony of the online description in his bio. It says, he has taught ministerial ethics and Christian principles in a very easy to understand and unique way. Retaining him as an honorary general board member while simultaneously promoting your Safe Church initiative seems contradictory and in poor taste. My submission is unique for a few reasons. I am neither a victim of John Grant nor of Calvary Gospel Church, but I know of and have heard directly from several who are. I believe the UPC's recognition of John Grant's abuse of power and the damage he has done to survivors would go a long way in allowing them the dignity of feeling seen and heard, in turn, aiding with their healing. It would also exemplify the love and compassion of Christ. The removal of his license and all official honors could lessen any further influence he may still hold. It would acknowledge the impact of his actions, 
serve as a small step towards reestablishing the survivor's trust in the Christian community, and send a clear message that the UPCI does not tolerate this type of behavior from their licensed ministers nor leaders in district positions. Nobody is untouchable because of their status or title. While John Grant has enjoyed a prosperous life of respect within the UPC, sexual abuse victims of CGC have been vilified and attacked by him, the CGC leaders, and saints. His lifestyle and esteem contrasts with the lengthy, expensive work victims faced attempting to cope heal and process years of trauma and shame, shame that was never theirs to carry in the first place. A safe faith environment would have established that and supported victims as soon as they came forward. Being a sexual assault victim should not ruin someone's reputation in a faith community. And sexual predators should not be allowed to move forward as if nothing happened easily attaining leadership and ministry opportunities. It's up to those in charge to ensure that doesn't happen. John Grant failed to do this. Both Stephen Dahl and Glenn Uselman were predators John Grant knew about, and he promoted and allowed them to lead under his watch as a UPCI minister and district superintendent. Two generations of young girls fled that church, broken. That's entirely different than young people deciding they don't believe anymore and choosing a different path. Young girls were viewed and treated as problems to be managed at CGC while grown men were given a pass for almost everything. Some victims and their parents left together, impacting the faith of entire families. If you sit with that for a moment, it's sobering. While this complaint is not a firsthand account, it's also not hearsay, as a handful of survivors of this church are on public record detailing the abuse they suffered and the reaction of their former pastor, John Wesley Grant. One survivor, Debbie McNulty, is a friend of mine, and this has profoundly impacted every aspect of her life. My love for her and the other survivors compelled me to bring this to you. Another unusual aspect of this complaint is that the Judicial Committee would have to do some of its own research, collect information, and possibly even reach out to survivors independently. And I can't promise they would be willing to speak with you. Debbie McNulty has told me that she would be willing and provided her contact information. Lois Gibson of the SpiritualAbuse.org Ministry has extensively covered these cases with a series of blog posts as well as posting on the public spiritual abuse Facebook page. She is credible and thorough. And while writing the article, she spoke personally with survivors and those who would, could corroborate their stories. Lois has also provided her contact information and expressed her willingness to talk with you. She has encouraged survivors to file a complaint against John Grant. She and I have offered support and assistance if they did. But as I'm sure you can understand, CGC survivors do not trust ministers anymore and especially view UPCI ministers as loyal to their own. Several survivors are no longer Christians and see filing a complaint as an outsider as a waste of time, stirring up their trauma and anxiety for nothing. They're tired and unwilling to allow the church an opportunity to reject them further. Considering their collective experiences at Calvary Gospel, their feelings are valid. One survivor told me that expecting Madison survivors to jump through UPCI bureaucratic hoops before the organization is inclined to investigate is immoral. I can't disagree. It also lacks compassion. The information is out there. That should be concerning enough to prompt an investigation. Various UPC ministers have been aware of this situation for a while. Ethics and integrity should have prompted an investigation long before now. The Madison Church has numerous sexual abuse victims who have not spoken out publicly for various reasons. 
Some still have family attending CGC and fear repercussions. Many fear the grants. And several are dealing with residual mental health struggles due to the abuse they suffered in the way John Grant handled it. They don't have the mental and emotional bandwidth to take this on right now. Sadly, others are no longer with us. It's heartbreaking. Five survivors have courageously gone on public record with firsthand accounts. Debbie McNulty, Rebecca Martin Bird, Rachel Capaccio, Lisa Kume, and Dina Webb were all sexually abused at Calvary Gospel Church. All five have shared their firsthand accounts publicly, including John Grant's treatment of them when he was made aware. Debbie has written extensively about her abuse in her blog, Surviving Church and Childhood. Debbie, Rebecca, Rachel, and Lisa shared their stories with a reporter for the Cap Times, and Dina gave testimony of her own abuse under oath in support of Rebecca in the recent trial of former UPCI licensed minister and evangelist, Glenn Uselman. He was found guilty on all five counts of sexual abuse of a minor. On count one, the judge sentenced Uselman to two and a half years in prison, withheld sentencing on the other four counts, and placed him on probation for five years. He must register as a sex offender and his DNA is to be on file. This abuse happened at CGC when John Grant was the pastor and grooming Glenn for ministry. John Grant knew. Dina told me that John Grant not only knew about her abuse, which started when she was 14 years old, but encouraged her to date Glenn rather than boys her age because he said that she was too experienced for church boys and better suited for 24-year-old Glenn because he was older. Dina was 15 at the time of the conversation with John Grant. That's a considerable age gap when one is an adolescent. Eventually, Glenn turned his sights toward 12-year-old Rebecca. None of this was scrutinized or discouraged by John Grant. An article on the Spiritual Abuse blog outlines John Grant's reaction to discovering that Rebecca Martin Bird was being abused. And this is the quote. When Rebecca was 12 to 13 years old, she wrote a letter to her pen pal about what was happening with Uselman. Her sister, who attended Calvary Gospel Church, allegedly gave the letters to John Wesley Grant, the pastor who is now considered the bishop of the church. John Grant then brought Rebecca and her parents into the church office and warned Rebecca that if she talked about this, it could ruin Uselman's life and damage the church. Rebecca claims that Uselman later confronted her in the church parking lot shortly after her meeting with John Grant. Uselman pushed her into a car and said, you talked. Uselman told her you cannot tell and also told her they had something special. She was terrified at the time and knew she was in trouble. While John Grant has no known sexual abuse victims of his own, by not reporting, he is an enabler of some of these abuses. Had he taken proper action when he found out that Uselman was sexually abusing Dina, as highlighted at the trial, at the very least, parents at CGC would have known to watch out for Glenn. Glenn might have even been criminally charged or convicted, protecting Rebecca from being subjected to his abuse next and sparing her the devastating trauma she still deals with today. When one considers the stats on a predator abusing multiple victims, John Grant shares some responsibility here. When Cap Times reporter Caitlin Farrell reached out to CGC for a comment on her article, Stolen Childhoods, she was told by John Seidel, Calvary Gospel's executive pastor, the pastors and elders of Calvary Gospel Church are aware of the allegations that have been made. We are reviewing those allegations. We will continue to cooperate with law enforcement officials as required. We obey and apply all mandatory reporting requirements defined by law in Wisconsin. That's misleading. 
carefully worded, similar to how a secular business would do damage control and play PR games with the press. Wisconsin has a clergy loophole, meaning that clergy are not currently required to report allegations of sexual assault anytime allegations are disclosed in private. So this originally applied to a Catholic confessional type situation, but in recent years has been exploited by other ministers to avoid being held responsible for not reporting sexual abuse cases. This adds perspective to his statement. I wonder how their review of the allegations went. Do you think they actually did one? How thorough do you think the current pastor, Roy Grant, would be in a review of his father? Especially considering Roy's own history of alleged inappropriate behavior. Do you think any of the pastors and elders would cross John Grant, even if they did believe he was wrong? So is that it? As Christians, we don't submit to a moral standard higher than the secular laws of the state. And if there's a loophole, we take it. A few CGC survivors supported a bill that would make clergy mandatory reporters no matter how and where the abuse is disclosed, which ethically should be done anyway. This prompted them to agree to be interviewed by the Cap Times in August of 2019. These courageous ladies have all endured personal backlash due to speaking out. This has been a heavy mental load, and I can assure you, none of them approached it lightly. Their experiences are spelled out clearly in the Cap Times news articles linked on the resource pages I included. While this may not be a typical judicial complaint, considering the seriousness of the allegations, the long-running timeline of the mishandling of these crimes, the high district position of the minister in question, and the multiplicity of victims, I hope this situation might warrant special treatment. Factors I believe would qualify it for special treatment are, and I, I, um, listed them and I'll read them from the letter. First one, when survivor Debbie McNulty reached out to David Bernard through Facebook Messenger in July of 2020, she sent him several links to videos, articles, and blog posts detailing the cases of sexual abuse at CGC. Had he read and watched those links, he would have familiarized himself with the issues I'm reporting in this letter. This was her report to a UPCI official, the top official. When her abuse occurred, 11-year-old Debbie would have never known to file a complaint, nor should she have been responsible to. She courageously reported it to her pastor and district superintendent, John Grant, who did nothing with that information. These are the two instructions recommended under how to report abuse on the UPC Safe Church page. Debbie told me that at 13, she met with John Grant to report the sexual abuse she experienced from Stephen Dahl, which started when she was 11 years old. She was alone in his office, and neither her mother nor any other adult was brought in to be a part of that meeting. She recalls him setting a tape recorder on the desk and asking her permission to record their conversation. She said yes and told him everything. She still has no idea why he did that or if he recorded it. He said he'd handle it and she never heard anything about it again. Nobody checked in with her to see if she was okay or offered her any support. John Grant did not inform her mother or report it to the police. However, he must have told someone as Debbie's mom heard it through the church grapevine. Not too long afterward, Dahl was caught in bed with his wife's minor sister and left CGC. Stephen Dahl currently pastors an independent Pentecostal church in Wisconsin where he lives with his wife, Alice, one of his minor victims. At the time of the incident, she was 15 and he was 31. CGC was a mess. Dahl's first wife filed for divorce, which was finalized on March 26, 1985. Shortly after her sister Alice turned 18, Stephen Dahl and Alice eloped in Vegas. 
on April 17, 1986. He has since whitewashed his past by characterizing his past mistakes as adultery. That's hardly what it was. This information has relevance because UPC ministers have fellowshiped with him over the years. In the 90s, after all this happened, by his own admission in social media posts, Stephen Dahl helped in a UPC church and was used in that church's prison ministry under Reverend John Bridges in Nina, Wisconsin. He taught Sunday school and occasionally preached in the youth group. During that time, April of 1995, Stephen started a UPCI daughter work in Oconto, Wisconsin, where he was considered the pastor by Bridges and the Wisconsin District, even though he wasn't licensed. This information came from posts Dahl made on social media. John Grant was the district superintendent at this time with full knowledge of his past crimes. An online church directory for Wisconsin published on January 30th, 2007, confirms Stephen Dahl was officially recognized as the Oconto Daughter Church's pastor, even though he had a shocking predatory past and was not a UPCI licensed minister. John Grant doesn't seem like a man who has a clue about ministerial ethics and Christian principles. I have heard through the grapevine that Stephen Dahl has other victims, but I have no proof I'm at liberty to share. Either way, with his history of grooming and sexually abusing underage girls, he should have never been allowed in a position of influence, authority, or access to minors. The last place he needed to be was teaching a UPC senior high Sunday school class and influencing a youth group. This has understandably not improved Debbie's opinion of the integrity of UPC ministers. One thing she sadly noted about her interaction with Dr. Bernard in 2020 was his lack of compassion for her personally. She felt he didn't care about her suffering and that his formal response was mainly a legal attempt to safeguard the UPCI organization. In this conversation, he did not explicitly encourage her to file a complaint against John Grant for mishandling her abuse. I'm not sure why, but it adds perspective to why these ladies aren't convinced the UPC wants to handle this. My next point, Calvary Gospel UPC produced so many victims that they formed a private survivor group in Madison. It was birthed in early 2018 due to Debbie McNulty blogging about her sexual abuse. Once local readers of her blog realized that they weren't alone in their trauma, several survivors of CGC reached out to her sharing their own stories. The depressing realization of the sheer number of victims prompted the formation of the support group to comfort and support Calvary Gospel's sexual abuse survivors as they pursued healing. These women span decades in their attendance at CGC. Still, their common denominator is growing up in a church where the grooming and sexual abuse of young girls by much older men was normalized and overlooked by the adults who should have protected them, including their pastor, John Grant. He and the other leaders at the church had an unhealthy attitude toward the young victims. Victim blaming might be a newer phrase, but it is certainly not a new practice. When I first met Debbie and she told me her story disclosing how many survivors were in the support group, I assumed several of them must have had the same abuser. Imagine my shock to find out that most of them had different abusers. At the current count, the group accounts for 30 plus victims of Calvary Gospel. This is a systemic cultural problem in this church, and most of it happened under John Grant's leadership. What a shameful legacy. Next point. Some of these abuses and cover-ups happened while John Grant was the Wisconsin District Superintendent for the UPCI, meaning they were reported to the District Superintendent when the victim simply went to their pastor. If this was his approach with his own church, 
It's alarming to consider how he may have mishandled district cases. My next point. John Grant desperately tried to avoid appearing in person to testify in court at the Uselman trial. If you get the transcripts, you will see that he irritated the judge with his antics. He first attempted to avoid attending in person, claiming poor health, requesting to attend through Zoom. Once the judge said he was to attend in person and that the only way he was getting out of it was if he were hospitalized or something serious like that, he was supposedly admitted to a nursing home. By the week of the trial, he was admitted to the hospital. The judge sent officers to the hospital to pick him up and escort him to the courthouse. Knowing they were coming, he checked himself out before they got there. It was clear what he was trying to do. In the end, he did have to attend in person. For someone so pleased with the idea of authority and submission, he wasn't such a fan when he was expected to obey and submit to the legal system. Survivors in attendance told me that between his poor memory and outright lying on the stand, he did everything he could to avoid admitting to the toxic environment at CGC and how he handled situations of abuse that were brought to him. During the trial, the testimony of other witnesses, including former UPC Minister John Eckenrod, who was previously on staff at CGC, confirmed and supported the witness accounts given by survivors. This is a man entrusted with the care of the saints of God, representing your organization. When questioned during the Uselman case, under oath, Grant admitted that he wanted the men to stay at his church, so he permitted relationships with the young girls. This, of course, benefited him financially in tithes and kept his church growing. Over the years, he has enjoyed being the recipient of lavish gifts from a large church, Cadillacs, expensive trips, a significant addition to his home, along with other generous monetary and personal gifts. This doesn't even take into account his income. I'd say his strategy worked. One professional involved in the case raised the question privately as to whether this could fall under the category of sex trafficking, akin to pimping out minor girls to benefit the pastor financially. This disturbing concept was also brought up twice at the sentencing of Glenn Uselman in October of 2022. I hope you can access the sentencing transcripts. Grant's name was negatively brought up more than once from parties on both sides of this case. My next point. Another factor to consider is the spiritual impact this has had on the victims. Some are no longer Christians, partly because of the abuse they suffered and how they were treated by their pastor and church family. As an organization that claims to take the whole gospel to the whole world, you cannot overlook the significant wake of destruction one UPC church and pastor has left on the kingdom of God in your home country. My next point was, I hope you will compassionately recognize the amount of anxiety, stress, and backlash the survivors have recently endured due to the trial and conviction of Rebecca Martin Bird's abuser, Glenn Uselman. The most vocal survivors are too battle-weary from recent events to take on another fight, and some have expressed fear for their personal physical safety. While many CGC members are sensible and would never pose a threat to anyone, there are always a few extreme individuals who are very loyal to the pastor, the church, and even some of the predators. Most survivors have fear and anxiety associated with John Grant, his family, and the members of CGC. That's how trauma works. It's also how corrupt power and influence maintains control. Their memories of him are not of the frail elderly man he has become. For decades, he was larger than life the most obeyed, revered authority figure in their lives during their formative years. This still impacts them. On the last day of testimony, several survivors showed up, sat together in solidarity, and faced him as he testified. 
Facing him in court was a huge hurdle for them. The recent Safe Church initiative has been promoted as representing a move on the UPCI's part to show that you take abuse, abuse of power, and any cover-up seriously. I sincerely hope you will. I know I'm asking for an unconventional approach on your part, but an honored minister representing your organization with public allegations questioning his integrity reflects poorly on the seriousness with which the UPCI takes abuse and protects their most vulnerable. I'm sure you find this concerning as well. Considering John Grant's advanced age of 82 years and poor health, there is urgency in this case. Once he dies, the backlash toward anyone filing against him will involve accusations of waiting until he died and could not defend himself. I would like to see this made right while he's still alive. John Wesley Grant's legacy of poor leadership has left a wake of destruction. He mishandled numerous cases of sexual abuse, blamed and publicly humiliated minor victims, covered up sexual abuses, failed to report what he knew to parents and to the police, avoided notifying the church of predators in their midst for safety purposes, and reserved his loyalty for abusers, especially showing grace and favor to predators pursuing ministry roles. It seems clear that he is unfit to be a licensed minister, a recipient of the Order of the Faith, and an honorary general board member. John Grant is not a safe leader. He has disqualified himself repeatedly. I know this will not be easy, especially for those of you who know and respect him, but as you soberly review this information, I hope your duty and compassion will also extend to the victims and their lost childhoods. Compassion for victims often gets rushed past when faith communities are in shock, grieving the lost reputation of a colleague and friend. I hope you will commit to keeping the survivors of CGC in your prayers. Decades later, they're still trying to heal. I will submit a paper and digital copy of the resources to make following the links easier. Thank you for your time and consideration. I prayerfully await your decision. Sincerely, Deanna Jo Norton. So that was my letter. It was long. I told you it was long. <laughs> I had to stop the video halfway through because my neighbor fired up their lawnmower. And so I had to wait till they were finished mowing their lawn. Um, but yeah, it was a long letter. And I really wasn't sure if anything would come of it, but I ran it by the survivor community to make sure they were comfortable with it before I mailed it. You know, especially anyone who was mentioned by name. And two of them did send me letters to include with my submission. And then eventually a third one did as well. Um, so initially we had one survivor letter and one support letter to include, which, you know, I really thought added more weight to it. And I will read, I have permission to read their letters in the next video. Um, but David Bernard's office received my registered letter on December the 16th, 2022. It was a Friday. And actually that same day I had I just returned from Christmas shopping and I called my mother to tell her what I bought. And the second I disconnected the phone uh, with her, the phone rang in my hand <laughs> and I thought it was mom calling me back to tell me something she had forgotten to tell me when we were talking. And um, like, you have to understand, I had just spent the entire week working on episode 71 for this channel uh, titled Christian Liberty, my response to a UPC sermon from Superintendent David Bernard. And so I had listened to his general conference sermon and like the isolated clips, like the part that I wanted to address um, over and over and over all week long. And so his voice had been in my ear for the entire week. And so when I picked up the phone, this lady on the other end says, you know, this is Rhonda Morley calling from Brother Bernard's office. And he was wondering if he could have a few minutes of 
your time. And so I've said, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, you know, when what to my wondering ears did appear, but this familiar voice I'd been listening to all week long um, was on the other end of the line. And he said, hello, this is, this is brother Bernard. I can't remember if he said brother Bernard or David Bernard, whatever. But uh, it was <laughs> kind of funny uh, considering, but um, I was surprised he called me. I, I will say that. And in my next video, I'm going to talk about that phone call. And as well as the next day, I received a call. I think it was the next day from Lisa Reddy, who is the chair of the Safe Church Committee. And I'll just read the letters I included with mine and just kind of share how the process went along for me and um basically what happened next. So anyway, I know it was a long letter. I'm sure he felt that way when he read it, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you if you hung in this far in, um, in this video. So if you enjoyed it, you can like and share. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel, but you'd like to know when I post a new video, you can hit subscribe and the little notification bell and YouTube will notify you when I do. So I hope everybody has a great day.